Good morning, friends. Welcome back to BioNews and happy Wednesday. Today, I have a few papers to discuss with you, beginning with a paper on amphetamines and propranolol, which is a beta blocker. Many of you may have heard of propranolol from me from before. Propranolol is a non-selective beta blocker that easily passes in, uh, through the blood-brain barrier into the brain. It is often used uh, to deal with uh, anxiety, social anxiety acutely uh, for people, to help them with, for example, uh, lectures in front of large audiences, to help snipers steady their hands. Well, although propranolol is not necessarily the best for that, you choose something that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier because you're just trying to reduce adrenaline, adrenergic um, signaling at the hands. Anyway, this is a little off topic. So this paper concerns amphetamines and propranolol. Before we discuss the results of the paper, let me give you a little bit of a background about amphetamines and stimulants and ADHD. I have some interesting notes for you. First of all, the first time that amphetamines were used for what's now called ADHD happened in 1937 when Charles uh, Bradley made the observation that a racemic, which I didn't know how to pronounce until Guerrilla Chemist recently corrected me, I used to call it a racemic, a racemic amphetamine produced what he called a calming effect in problem children. Now, it's shown that over 50% of the metabolites of amphetamine and methamphetamine uh, involve the 5-hydroxy uh, derivative of both of those. And the 5-hydroxy derivative of both amphetamine and methamphetamine is produced by an enzyme called CYP2D6. And now let's talk about this enzyme a little bit. The enzyme exists in the, bo in the body as well as in the brain. So amphetamine could pass into the brain and be converted b via this enzyme, or it could be converted in the body, right? Now, a couple of notes about the enzyme. C CYP2D6 has uh, several polymorphisms in it that greatly affect how active the enzyme is in various people. So, how much you convert amphetamine to 5-hydroxy uh, amphetamine will depend a lot on how active your enzyme is, particularly in the brain as well. The environment also affects how much of this enzyme you have. So, for example, smokers and drinkers have more of this enzyme in their brain, likely, likely because it is relevant, it is called into the brain because of the availability of nicotine as well as alcohol. Um, also, it's important to note that this derivative of the CYP2D6 enzyme, which is the 4-hydroxy amphetamine or 4-hydroxy uh, methamphetamine, or it's called OHAMP or OHMAMP for the methamphetamine, it does not readily cross the blood-brain barrier. So what's really important is how much two, uh, CYP2D6 you have in your brain. Now, this will all be relevant. This all makes sense in a little bit. So that's one thing about the metabolism of amphetamine and methamphetamine. Now, talking about the effects of amphetamines. I often mention that lower doses of amphetamines are far superior to higher doses of amphetamines. Uh, there's a study I found to, to exemplify this with dextroamphetamine, which is my favorite amphetamine, which composes 70, around 75% of the Adderall um, formulation, the actual Adderall, not generic. So a dose of 20 to 25 milligrams in adult humans at that dose, the peak plasma levels happen at two to three hours after administration. Maximum cardiovascular impact, like on your heart, happens after one hour. And the maximum behavioral effects happen after two hours. Now that's at a dose of 20 to 25 milligrams, which is about five times as what I would take myself. At a dose of 40 to 50 milligrams in a human adult male, you'll find that the plasma levels double and they peak around three to four hours instead of two to three hours after taking it. However, the behavioral effects decline after four hours, irrespective of the increased dose. So it doesn't, the, you increase the dose, the peak levels uh, happen later, and the behavioral effects stay somewhat the same. In fact, it's a little more complicated than that, and we can talk about that in another video based on my personal experiences, as well as we can do some more detailed research when we do our dopamine series. But anyway, I thought this would be interesting for now. Now, I'd like to make another note. Comparison between amphetamines and methamphetamine. What, uh, they have similar amounts of dopamine transmission. What they differ about mainly is um, the, the methamphetamine produces two to three times more serotonergic uh, release that, than amphetamines do. Well, serotonergic release is not very useful for focus and concentration in the mornings, so clearly methamphetamine would not be necessarily the, the choice that, that we would want to take. But the reason why methamphetamine has such a bad reputation is not because of that. It's, it's mainly because people take huge amounts of it and smoke it or inject it, which causes very different effects than taking 5 to 10 milligrams. I assume 5 to 10 milligrams would be almost indistinguishable for most people uh, when they compare amphetamine, uh, racemic amphetamine, to dextroamphetamine, to methamphetamine, to MDMA. It's very little differences in, in a 5 to 10 milligram dose. You can notice them, but they're very small. 
Anyway, um, continuing on. So, I wanted to make a little bit of an aside about methylphenidate, which is the uh, active, which is what Ritalin is. So, Ritalin is a 50-50 mixture of dextro 3 o methylphenidate and levo 3 o methylphenidate. The interesting thing is that it is the dextro 3 o methylphenidate that's the active molecule in Ritalin 2. So, I mean, it's not that it's not that dextroamphetamine is the active molecule in amphetamine. Level amphetamine works too, but it's interesting to say that dextroamphetamine has more dopaminergic effects than level amphetamine, or more concisely dopaminergic effects, and that the dextro rotation of the methylphenidate isomer is also more active. And a couple of notes about that: the the peak when you when uh, peak concentrations of uh, the racemic mixture occur one to two hours after ingestion and the half-life is two to seven hours uh, in total. The main metabolite of this racemic mixture is actually something called ritalinic acid and ritalinic acid is actually an inactive metabolite um, and as I said the most active metabolite is the dextro 3 o methylphenidate. Finally I wanted to make a final note this is all background before the study that we're actually about to discuss which is that Propranolol is also, the beta, beta blocker that I use, is also metabolized by the same enzyme that amphetamine is metabolized into for uh, hydroxyamphetamine, which is CYP2D6. The difference is that uh, propranolol acts sort of similarly to the way aromacin does in terms of the CYP2D6 enzyme as an irreversible suicide inhibitor. Specifically, it produces a re reactive metabolite that covalently bonds to one side, side of the two uh, CYP2D6 enzyme, inhibiting its action until there is new CYP2D6 enzyme turnover. What does this mean? This means that if you take propranolol while taking the amphetamine, you dramatically reduce the uh, conversion of amphetamine to 5-hydroxyamphetamine in the brain. What does that mean? Now, this is what the study uh, was about. So, propranolol pretreatment. And I believe the study was in rodents, of course, yeah. But I don't know if it was in vitro or in vivo, to be honest. I don't remember. It's been a few days since I read it. But propranolol pretreatment increased both methamphetamine and amphetamine concentrations in rodent brains and increased both dopamine and serotonin transmission in their brains, likely by inhibiting this. Brain 4-hydroxymethamphetamine uh, to methamphetamine ratios uh, decreased in line with the re decreased uh, synthesis of 4 uh, hydroxy methamphetamine and acute dopaminergic and serotonergic responses to methamphetamine sensitize propranolol treated rodents to future administrations which again touched on the subject that we discussed a, a little while ago about how drug naive people sometimes don't respond to dopaminergic drugs uh, the same way they do the first time than they do later so it seems that this was seen, seen also in the propranolol treated rodents that were given that were drug naive that were given um, methamphetamine here so this is an interesting study. To be honest with you guys, I have never known that propranolol was inhibiting this enzyme's activity. I've been taking propranolol with my amphetamines mainly because of this. The amphetamines increase the activity of noradrenaline in the brain. But I'm really not trying to hype myself up or get more stress responses in my brain. I'm really trying to use the dopamine to habituate myself to whatever I'm doing. This is really biohacking, real biohacking. So your brain releases dopamine naturally when you watch TV or when you listen to a nice song or when you go out with some friends or whatever. I cause my brain to release dopamine when I'm studying or when I'm reading or something like that. I'm not trying to get my brain to release noradrenaline or signal there. So I take the propranolol with the uh, dopamine, with the amphetamine, to block the effects, some of the effects on noradrenaline. So for example, dopamine is actually a ligand of the noradrenaline receptor and can sort of act like noradrenaline itself. Forget about noradrenaline as well. So it's sort of, I'm trying to on in that effect of the very low dose amphetamine on dopamine. And it's very interesting to find out that I, while I was doing this and seeing great effects from it and recommending it to people, I had no idea that I was actually really increasing the availability of actual amphetamine in the brain from that five milligram dose. Fascinating and uh, great to see. This is why we do the BioNews series. Uh, another study by, uh, this is our second study only and we've been, we're this far down the video. Anyway, and I uh, hope to go a bit faster. So Antonietta et al. This study involves curcumin, myelin, and the PPAR gamma receptor. You may have heard of PPR gamma because it's a target of drugs that are used to treat diabetes. The, when you agonize the PPR gamma receptor, which is a natural receptor that's a which is a receptor that's a natural ligand of fatty acids in our body, when you agonize that receptor, you improve uh, basically the metabolism of fats in the body um, in general. So. Anyway, this study involves curcumin, and what they found was that curcumin promotes the, this is it's an in vitro study, they found that curcumin promotes the differentiation of oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. 
Oligodendrocytes are cells in the nervous system that produce what's called myelin. Myelin is a lipid-rich uh, material that coats axons in our brain. The disease of not having enough myelin is called ALS. There's also MS as well. So here what they were finding out was that giving uh, curcumin to the brain cells in vitro promoted the differentiation of the, pro of the newly birthed uh, progenitor cells of oligodendrocytes particularly in inflammatory conditions, and it did this partially via its uh, modulation of the PPR gamma receptor, which tells you that telmisartan may be potentially helping you maintain your myelin in your brain. By the way, what is one of the biggest activators of myelin synthesis in the brain? Progesterone signaling at the progesterone receptor. And this is one of the concerns for people who may be, for example, taking TRT, but not taking HCG, because most of the progesterone in our body is synthesized by our gonads, and when you take TRT, you, in, you a lot that I inhibit a lot of that progesterone synthesis. This is something that I've discovered uh, myself or talked about myself that I never heard of anyone talk about before me. And I don't know how important it really is re in reality. You know, I don't know if that small change in progesterone will cause someone to develop uh, myelin conditions and neurodegenerative disease, but it certainly is a concern and something that hasn't been accounted for in the bioidentical hormone replacement uh, technology so far. A third paper by Bentz et al. Uh, focused on um, the uh, androgenicity of mothers and the uh, behavior of their offspring. So specifically, the su study sought to determine whether changes in the endocrine environments of mothers, not in their wombs, but of the mothers beforehand, affected the biology of offspring in the long term. And I don't usually read studies that are not on rodents, but this study is on the zebra finches, which are frequently studied. And what they did was they injected the maternal zebra finches with testosterone, increasing their androgenic uh, activity and increasing the androgenic activity of their eggs. And they found that the offspring born of these eggs were more aggressive in, in, during adulthood than the zebra finches that, uh, than the zebra finches born of mothers that were not injected with testosterone. This is really interesting because this may have a role a little bit in, in what some of the viewers of this channel um, are involved in. So some of the viewers of this channel are women who take androgens for aesthetic reasons and then have children. And we have, um, so for example, my friend Boston Lloyd, uh, his wife used to be a competitive uh, athlete, and he's noticed that his son has, he says, some great genetics for uh, things involved in androgenic, uh, androgenically related sports, I guess. I don't remember exactly what he said, but really this may be the case because uh, there may be long-standing changes in the epigenetics of mothers that have taken androgens before, and these may essentially cause their children to be more androgenic. This is really what this Ben said all paper is saying. Uh, Hertanak, uh, Hertanak at all, I assume this is a Turkish uh, gentleman, I don't know how to say his name, I do apologize. Uh, this study involved hippocampal volumes and life stress. Specifically, they were uh, studying the drug called venlaxifene, which I believe is an SNRI. They found that they were unable to find changes in hippocampal volumes of, pe um, of people given the venlaxifene drug unless they were undergoing life stresses at the time. Um, really, all the only reason I brought up this study was just to this, would bring up the subject of hippocampal volumes. So, for you guys to know, in adulthood, we birth new cells in our brain only in two areas, the subventricular zone and the subglandular zone. One of those two areas that's the most important with a subsegment of it is the hippocampus, the memory center of our brains. Interestingly, the hippocampus is also an area that's shown to be stunted in development among people who had life stressors in their childhood. So for example, me, I have a very horrible memory, I mean, shockingly horrible memory. I'm, oh, I can almost bet my life's fortune that if you did a scan on my brain, you would find an unusually small hippocampus. Um, so this study was basically showing that the, hippocamp the changes in hippocampal volumes with venlaxifene treatment were not apparent except in those currently undergoing life uh, stressors. What that means exactly, not completely clear, but it's interesting to think about because this is really the root of uh, reuptake inhibition in terms of serotonin, serotonin reuptake inhibition drugs, which is uh, neurogenesis that should be most prominently seen firstly in the hippocampus, where the new cells are birthed, and then they will be differentiated and per per perhaps proliferated throughout uh, the nervous system. But we should first see it there, and we're not seeing it except in the patients with current life stressors. That's what they're really saying. In the next paper by Wu et al., which studied um, people who have HIV, which are given combined uh, antiretroviral therapy, which is called CART, so they found that these people given CART, by the way, there were 400 plus people in the study of an average age of 54, had a greater non-ischemic fibrosis, 
which means deposition of scar tissue in their cardiovascular system and larger left atrial volumes than non-HIV infected people. Um, in a paper by Ku et al. regarding inflammation and coronary stenosis. See, neutrophil counts, which are used as a marker for inflammation duration in the body, have never yet been associated with coronary stenosis. In this study, building on the inflammatory hypothesis of atherosclerosis, which is a hypothesis that basically the plaque buildup in our cardiovascular system is modulated by the inflammation of our immune system. Anyway, building on this theory, for the first time, this study using logistic regression showed that the severity of coronary stenosis was positively associated with the neutrophil to HDLC ratio of the people. In a paper by uh, Jung or Young et al., um, this paper was studying a factor called macrophage migration inhibitory factor. MIF is a pro-inflammatory anti-apoptosis cytokine that is pathologic, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, but helpful in ALS. In this study, they found that MIF was helpful in attenuating post-stroke induced damage. In a paper by Monk et al. regarding fiber, the microbiome and inflammation, um, well, first of all, the background. So cooked beans, which are rich in fermentable, non-digestible fiber, have been shown to improve intestinal health in lean mice and attenuated intestinal dysbiosis and inflammation when given to mice that are obesogenic in their lifestyle. Uh, so in this study, what they did was this. They gave mice a, a high fat diet, and this is not a ketogenic diet, as I've said before, this is a high fat Western diet, okay? They gave them this high fat diet, and they gave another uh, group of rodents uh, a low fat diet. And then they gave, uh, of course, there's a placebo and everything, and they gave another group of rodents the same high fat diet, but all they did was replace 16% of that diet with cooked navy bean powder. What they found was that switching to the low fat diet improved intestinal health and adipose tissue inflammation less than replacing the 16% of the high fat diet with the cooked navy bean powder. And uh, Although the low fat diet did appear to cause greater weight loss in general and affect circulating hormones, I think like leptin and stuff like that more. Second final paper by Kwan et al. In this paper, they found that, so there's an association between colitis and intestinal diseases, GI autoimmune diseases, with uh, liver disease. So they sought to determine why NAFLD and hepatosteatosis, which means the inflammation, oh, a generalized inflammation of the liver. They fought, uh, sought to, oh, NAFLD, by the way, is a deposition of fat in the liver. It's a fatty liver that doesn't come from alcohol. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and hepatic steatosis. This study is sought to determine why they are associated with what's called ulcerative colitis, which is one of the two main forms of inflammatory bowel disease. What they found was that in, a, in the most common rodent model of ulcerative colitis, rodents developed hepatic fat accumulation and dyslipidemia, which means messed up cholesterol levels, due to overall metabolic dysfunction that is mediated by fibroblast growth factor FGF21, by adiponectin and by irisin via the CERT1, PGC1-alpha, and L, uh, LXR-alpha dependent pathways. The metabolic dysfunction in this case was included fatty, fatty acid oxidation, lipogenesis and lipolysis, reverse cholesterol transport, bile acid synthesis, which means that the GI issues were actually causing direct problems in the liver's function, as well as the browning of white fat uh, by the way, I have a video, Search Cold, on my channel. You can learn about that, the white, browning of white fat and brown fat and all that. And the thermogenic activity of brown fat, meaning that this probably dysbiosis is causing major metabolic problems in the body. That's basically what we learned there. The final paper by Hen Gartner et al. is a meta-analysis of 27 studies that found that while SSRIs are, not, are genuinely not associated with increased suicide risk among the depressed, newer generation antidepressants are, but they also found that this risk has been downplayed by study design biases due to funding from Big Pharma, uh, in line with something that Gorilla Chemist was talking about recently, but of course, uh, putting that into perspective. It's, they still did not find it associated with it, but they did find that there were study design biases likely intentionally put through by Big Pharma to not show this enhanced suicide risk. And by the way, there's also papers I've seen recently in the last two years calling for the FDA to add suicide risk for adults that take SSRIs as a potential side effect. It's right now, I believe, only there for children taking SSRIs. Anyway, guys, thanks for bearing with me. I'll see you tomorrow with another BioNews update.